So uh, just while Sharon is coming on, my name is Terry Kylo. I'm a Lutheran pastor. I'm the executive director of Paths to Understanding. Um, our, our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. And we're really happy all of you are joining us today, um, both on the webinar where you're going to get a lot of really great interaction with Amina, but also on those who are just watching on Facebook. And we, we're happy all of you are joining us um, today. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Amina. Amina Qureshi is a student of Islamic or traditional Islamic art. She was born in Qatar and immigrated to Canada where she spent her childhood and completed her education. She received an honors bachelor's in science majoring in psychology and art and art history at the University of Toronto. Intrigued by the beautiful patterns she found in the Islamic lands uh, from Eastern China to Spain, she began studying Islamic art. The study of Islamic art took her to London where she took courses at the art of Islamic pattern. Amina currently lives in Seattle, Washington where she teaches Islamic art. She teaches geometric and arabesque patterns at the local libraries, the Seattle public school system, and at her local community centers and mosques in the Puget Sound area. And Amina, we're just so happy that you're joining us for, for Interfaith Week and you're, you're kicking us off. And so uh, please go ahead and, um, and, uh, and tell us how to do this. And now I'm concerned that Amina might be frozen. So if people are able to, oh, there, there you are. I can see you moving now, Amina. Yeah, so, uh, so, so Amina, I've introduced you and, and we're happy to have you begin to teach us how to do things. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to share some art with you today. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, which means peace be upon you. And that is Muslim greeting. Walaikum assalam. And should I get started? Yes. All right. So hello, everyone. I'm going to start off with a quick PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to go over a little bit of history and some images of Islamic art. So starting off, um, I just want to talk about where did the term Islamic art come from? The term Islamic art is a modern concept created by art historians in the 19th century to categorize and study the materials produced under Islamic people that emerged from Arabia in the 7th century. To the term, Islamic art describes all of the art that was produced in these lands, where Islam is the dominant religion or the religion of those who ruled. It spans over 1400 years of history and has incredible diversity um, from Eastern Asia, South Asia, Middle East, North Africa, and Europe. Islamic art, I like to say that it's a cultural art form with religious influences. Uh, one of the main religious influences being that it is generally non-figurative, especially in places of worship. And that means that Islamic art doesn't have um, imagery of people or animals. And that has to do with um, the religious aspect. When Islam came about as a religion, it prohibited imagery of people and animals, especially in places of worship. Islamic art is mostly ornamental, meaning that it is used to decorate wide spaces, architectural buildings, manuscripts. It doesn't really have like a focal point, especially because there's no figures or animals sort of like in Christian art where you have um, a lot of storytelling that happens within art and um, you have like a center point where all your attention is drawn to. In Islamic art, it's mostly patterns that um, have repetition and cover wide spaces. The three main components of Islamic art are calligraphy, which is the Arabic script. Uh, it can be verses from the Quran. It could also be poetry. Second is geometric designs. Geometric art is very linear, has uh, shapes like stars, trapezoids, squares, hexagons. And lastly, we, uh, arabesque art, also known as Islami or biomorphic patterns. It's a lot more vegetal, organic, and more flowy. 
I'm going to show some images of calligraphy. This is um, a famous manuscript of the Quran, and this is in the Kufic script. Some more examples of calligraphy. This is the Nastalik script, which is a Persian script. So a little bit more about arabesque art. Uh, I mentioned it's also known as Islami or biomorphic patterns. It's based on floral and vegetal designs that can be seen throughout the Islamic world. These forms are typically um, based on a spiral. So you'll have a spirals a lot in the background from which other motifs and flowers sprout out from. And Islami compositions are reflected, they're repeated and tessellated to create harmonious designs that can be used on a variety of medium. I'm, I'm going to share a few um, basic forms of arabesque motifs. So th this is the Rumi motif. This is one of the most common styles. The word Rumi refers to the Turkish word Rum, which refers to Rome or Byzantium. This style is beautiful in its simplicity and perfect proportions. Over here you have the bird's wing motif and the pivotal point motif. The next one is tapelik. Tapelik is a Turkish word meaning hilltops. Kind of looks like little hilltops. Over here we have the kapali motif. This one is a lot, it's, it has sort of like an underlying geometric structure. Um, these are structural foundations uh, because other motifs such as the Rumi motif and the Tepelic motifs usually are attached to these. And I'm going to share some pictures from different parts of the world of different examples of arabesque art and geometric art. Over here we have the Alhambra Palace, which is in Spain. It's a really beautiful work of Moorish art. This is an example of an arabesque pattern, which, are, which is carved onto the walls. Here is another example. Over here, you can see both geometric and arabesque. Uh, in the center, you have an eight-pointed star, and within that, you have an arabesque motifs, and on the outside as well. A lot of times, um, geometric and arabesque art are not sort of isolated. They're sort of, uh, they're sort of done together. So you have a lot of geometric patterns with arabesque art within it. Or when you do have arabesque art, it usually has an underlying geometric structure. Over here we have a close-up of the Taj Mahal in India. So this would be South Asia. This is Mughal art. And here's another close-up of the details in the Taj Mahal. Over here you can see arabesque art. This is from Persia, modern-day Iran. And this is an example of arabesque art. You can see how symmetrical it is. It's sort of like a mandala. And um, it has um, an underlying geometric structure to it. This is also from Iran. These are domes of a mosque. And on it, you have this beautiful arabesque patterns and also some geometric patterns. This is the interior of a dome in a mosque in Iran, the Sheikh Lotfullah Mosque. And it's very, this is one of my favorite works and it's very beautiful, it's very intricate. It has this under uh, geometric sort of pattern to it. And within the geometric pattern, you have uh, these beautiful arabesque patterns. This is Turkey, Istanbul, Turkey. This is the Sultan Ahmed Mosque, also known as the Blue Mosque because it's very blue <laughs> and has these beautiful blue tiles inside. Here's a little um, close up of the interior. You can see the domes within the mosque. I'm gonna talk a bit more about geometric patterns. All geometric patterns can be made without any mathematical calculations. All you really need is a compass and a ruler. They're a product of both rules and creativity. The basic rules for each composition are about the same, and the creativity is the input of the individual. Understanding these rules and recognizing them in a pattern opens up a way to understand the design process and creative choices that Islamic geometric designs offer. Over here, um, 
you can see sort of how the, these patterns can be broken down. All geometric patterns start off with a square and then are divided into equal parts. And based on the number of parts that the pattern is divided into, you can categorize it as fourfold. Now, fourfold patterns, as you can see in this chart, you can get different shapes out of it. You can get a square, you can get an octagon, you can get an eight-pointed star, a 16-pointed star, and you'll notice all these are multiples of four. So you have the, an octagon which has eight sides or a 16-pointed star, which has 16 points. And similarly, if you divide into five equal parts, from there you can get shapes such as pentagons, five-pointed stars, ten-pointed stars. And lastly, we have a six-fold pattern, which is a circle divided into six equal parts. You can get hexagons, six-pointed stars, and twelve-pointed stars. Here are some examples of geometry in um, different historical buildings around the world. This, again, we have the Alhambra Palace in Spain, and you can see the tile work, the colorful tile work. You have these beautiful squares, and if you look really closely, the dots between the squares, it looks like little circles. They're eight-pointed stars. Here's a close-up of some more tile work from the Alhambra Palace. This one is a little bit unique because um, most geometric patterns it's a lot more linear, but over here we see some curved shapes. And this is one of those unique patterns where you see um, shapes that have curves, otherwise it's mostly linear. Over here we have, um, this is from the Ithmad Badawla. It's in Agra, India. And this would be an example of mobile art. This is a close up of I believe it's a mosaic or, or tile work. Uh, I think it's like marble stonework. And in the center, you have geometric patterns. You have these six pointed stars and you also have arabesque art within it. So within these uh, geometric patterns, the hexagon and the star, you have these flowers and around you have this beautiful border. Going back to the Alhambra Palace, this is another example. Over here you can see all three elements. You have the geometric pattern and the tile work. You have the calligraphy that's carved in the, I believe it's stone or plaster. And behind the calligraphy you can see arabesque motifs. Now this here is the pattern that we're going to be drawing today. So over here, one indication of determining how many folds a pattern has is looking at the center shape. So at the very center here, you see sort of like a flower or sort of a star shape. And if you count out the amount of uh, the points on it, you count out there's eight points. So from there, we can say that this is a fourfold pattern. So we know we're going to be starting off with a circle and then we're going to be dividing into four equal parts and then eight equal parts and then working from there. And the outer shape of this pattern is also an eight-pointed star. And within it, we have this arabesque pattern. So we will be starting off by drawing the geometric portion, and then we will be drawing in the arabesque portion, which is the floral aspects of it. We're going to be drawing a slightly simplified version of this pattern. I don't know if you could see very well, but it's going to be, look something like this over here. And Let's get started. Oh, here's a black and white <laughs> image. Sometimes when looking at black and white images rather than color images, you can pick out more details and the structure of the pattern better. This, um, this is a early 13th century tile from Iran. And this is currently in the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in one of their galleries. So let's get started. I'm just going to take a minute to switch cameras and I'll be right back.
Amina, I think you're muted. Hello, everyone. I'm back. So over here, I have a piece of paper that's fairly large. You can use any size paper. Letter size paper will work just fine. And I have a compass. So the compass I have, um, you may have a different compass, and that's perfectly fine, as long as you have a tip that has a metal and you have a tip that has a lead piece or a piece that you can attach a pencil or a pen or anything to. So I'll be referring to this one as the metal tip and this as the lead tip. I have some tape that we'll be using later on. I have another pencil, a ruler, and I have tracing paper. Now, if you don't have tracing paper, parchment paper will work just fine. Just anything that you can see through. We'll be using that later on. So starting off, I'm going to find the center of my page and I'm going to draw a horizontal line through it. Now, one way to do that is you can take your ruler and measure your paper down here and find the center point of that edge and then do the same on this side. Find the center of this edge. And once you mark those two centers, you can take your ruler and draw a horizontal line connecting the two. Once you've done that, you can take your ruler and measure out the center. I'll just give everyone a moment to catch up. So we're finding the center on this edge and this edge. We're connecting it using a ruler and then we're finding the center point of that line. Once we've done that, this is the center point of my line. This is my horizontal line here. I'm going to put my metal tip on the very center and I'm going to draw a circle. Now, before I do that, I have opened up my compass so that it is about four inches. And if you have letter sized paper, that should fit on your paper. If you have a larger piece of paper, you can open it up further. I would say don't go over five inches or four and a half should be like a good size. But if you have letter size paper, I would recommend four inches. So you're going to open up your compass. One way to measure it out is to just put your compass against a ruler. I have mine open to about four and a quarter. And I'm going to put my metal tip on the very center, of the horizontal line, and I'm going to draw a circle. And a, a tip for using your compass when drawing circles is to hold the top part here and you want to apply pressure so that it's going down this way. And so this side you can maneuver easily. So I'm going to hold it like this. And then I'm going to draw a circle. Like that. Can everyone see that well? So that's my circle. So that's our very first step. Now, we talked about we're drawing a fourfold pattern. At this point, I have a circle that's divided into two equal parts. You can think of it as a pizza. So now our pizza has two very large slices. We want to divide it into four equal parts. To do that, I'm going to take my compass. And without changing the radius, I'm going to put my metal tip where the horizontal line intersects with the circle over here. So that's my metal tip and that's my lead tip. I'm going to make sure my lead tip is in the center of the circle. And I'm going to draw about a little more than a half circle, like three quarters of the circle this way. 
Well, Amina, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, so how hard should we, how, how thick should these lines be? Should these be pretty, pretty soft lines? Or is it okay if they're, if they're darker, more full lines? You can make them um, as softest or dark as you like. I would recommend keeping them soft so that they can, the lines can be very, very precise. Okay. Um, enough so that you can see them. I'm going over them for, so that you can see it on the screen, but you don't need to go over them twice. Okay, thank you. Over here, I'm gonna take my metal tip and I'm gonna put it where the horizontal line intersects with the circle on the other side. I'm gonna make sure my lead tip is in the center of the circle and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna draw about three quarters of a circle. Once I have that, I'm gonna take my compass I'm gonna reduce the radius just a little bit. Now on my compass, I have a little dial here that I could use to reduce it. And I'm gonna put my metal tip where the circle intersect with the first circle that we drew. So right here, I'm gonna put my metal tip. Now it doesn't matter how much you open up your compass, as long as your pencil is about like three quarters of the way to this circle. And I'm going to draw a little mark like that. Now, without changing your radius, you're going to put the, your metal tip where these two circles intersect. You really want to take your time and make sure your lines are precise. And you're going to draw another mark at the top like that. So it should create like a X. It doesn't matter uh, how big or small your X is, as long as you have an X. And we're going to do the same thing at the bottom over here. So where these two circles intersect, I'm going to put my metal tip. I'm going to take my time and make sure it's really precise and exactly where they inter intersect. And draw a little mark. And do the same on the other side. If at any point I'm going too fast um, and you'd like me to slow down, you can just uh, let us know in the chat and I can slow down or go back a few steps. So now I have two X's over here and here. And I'm gonna use that to draw a line down the circle. So this X here, if I put my pencil in the very center and join it with the very center at the top here. I'm going to draw a line down like this. And it should go through the center of your circle. I'm just going to go over my horizontal line to make it darker. So at this point, I have a circle that's divided into four equal parts. The next step, I am going to take my compass and I'm going to put the metal tip where the line, where the vertical line intersects with the circle. And I'm going to open up my compass so that the lead tip is back in the center. like this. And I'm going to draw about three quarters of a circle again. Like so. And I'm going to do the same thing at the top. My metal tip where the vertical line intersects with the circle. And my lead tip in the center. I'm going to draw a half, I'm going to draw about three quarters of the circle. Okay. I think you might want to help us go back just a little bit. 
because I, I think I'm I think I'm doing okay, but I want to make sure I want to make sure everybody's able to keep up, because you are good at changing that compass. <laughs> All right. I think I've got it though. I, I don't have an X at the top because my paper, I think I went for too big a circle. I see. It's okay um, as long, even if you get the X within the circle, that works okay. as well. Okay. Well, I might work on that then. Making the X. So we have a circle, and then we started off with the horizontal line. We put our metal tip here and our lead tip in the center, and we drew this circle here. Then we did the same thing on this side. We put our metal tip here, our lead tip here, and we drew a circle. And then using these two circles where they intersected with the first circle that we drew, we drew these X. We did that by decreasing the size of our compass to here. And then we drew a mark this way and then that way. And then we did that at the bottom as well. And then what that did is connecting these two X's, it divided the circle into four equal parts. And from there, we used this vertical line to draw another circle this way by putting the lead tip over here and the metal tip in the center, we drew a circle. And then we did the same thing here. We put our metal tip here and we put our lead tip in the center and drew a circle this way. Are we ready to move on? Okay, so at this point, we have our circle divided into four equal parts. And next, I wanna divide it into eight equal parts. The way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna use these sort of petal shapes that we've created. We have one, two, three, four of these. We're gonna connect them or, um, diagonally. So let's use a marker here. I'm gonna connect this point and that point. Like so. Once we have that, we're gonna connect this point and this point. Hmm. Amina, I think my compass is letting me down because uh, I'm, my lines, diagonal lines are not going through the center the way yours do. I see. You might have to um, adjust your circles. Okay. If they're, if they're off by just a little bit, that's fine. It's, but it's, if like, a, really it's like a third of an inch. <laughs> I'll just give everyone a few minutes to catch up. Yeah. Would you like me to go over it one more time? How's everybody? Uh, yeah, uh, Kim, Kim says we're going a little too fast. All right, we'll slow down. Let's do this one more time. Let's start with a fresh piece of paper. This is probably the hardest part, and after that, it'll get easier once we've divided into eight equal parts. So I'm just going to do a quick 
one here. So I have my horizontal line. Yeah, I think a second try will be will be really helpful for me. Okay. Let's say if you're using a letter sized paper, let's do three and a half inches. Yeah. We're gonna start off with drawing a circle. So we have a circle with the horizontal line going through. Once we have that, we will take our compass and we will put our metal tip where the horizontal line intersects with the circle and we will make sure that our lead tip is in the very center, like so. And we will draw three quarters of a circle, like so. I'm doing much better this time. It is always easier the second time. Again, I'm gonna put do the same on the other side. I'm gonna put my metal tip where the line intersects with the circle, and I'm gonna put my lead tip in the very center. I'm gonna draw about three quarters of a circle, like so. Once I have that, I'm going to reduce the size of my compass just by a little bit. And I'm going to put my metal tip where this circle intersects with the first circle that we drew right over here. I'm going to use a blue pen, blue marker to indicate that point here. And when I put my metal tip here, I want my pencil to be about a little more than halfway across. Okay, a little more than half. Yeah, that because because on a on an eight and a half by eleven paper, you 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 won't have an X if you don't if you have it too big. Yeah, even if um you can do it exactly halfway across, like this, and your X will just be within the circle. I see. And then, when you do it on the other side, it would be like this, and that would be your little X. Going back here, and then I'm going to do the same thing on these three points here. Yep. I'm keeping up with you this time. How's everybody else doing? I'm sorry for going too fast in the beginning. Um, the top. And we should tell everybody that that this uh, this is going to be on on Facebook or, and or on YouTube, um, so um, you will be able to watch again. So I have my line at the bottom, and then this very last point here. Do the same thing. The key is not to keep your compass the same size the whole time. So you want if you have a good sturdy compass. You're, it won't shift on you. Now, once you have these two X's, the center of these two X's, the here and here, that's what you're gonna use to draw the next line. You're gonna connect them. And it should also go through the very center of your circle.
like so. It lined up this time, yay. That's great. <laughs> so now we have a circle that's divided into four equal parts. Since we're drawing a eight-pointed star, we want to next divide our circle into eight equal parts. To do this, we're gonna take our compass and we're gonna open it up to the original size that we did to draw this circle. So I'm gonna put my metal tip in the center and I'm gonna open it up so that my lead tip is at the edge of the circle. You wanna be as precise as you can. And you're, you're gonna take your compass, you're gonna put the metal tip on the horizontal line, sorry, on the vertical line. And I'll do this one with a pink marker at these two points. So you're gonna put your metal tip here. Your lead tip is gonna to go to the center. And then you're gonna draw about three quarters of a circle. You're gonna do the same at the top. Metal tip over here, your lead tip in the center. And at this point, you should have these four petals. I'll just give everyone a minute. I think I got it this time. It's looking much better. Is it more proportional? Yeah, I think the, the smaller the smaller circle on the first the first circle really helped. That's great. I'm gonna take my pink marker and I'm gonna mark these four points. This is sort of the tip of these four petals where the two circles intersect. And we're gonna use these four points to draw two diagonal lines. And these lines are going to divide our circle into eight equal parts. So Amina, I, I want to ask, um, I wonder how old the compass is and did they start off drawing with these with a compass or did that happen later or do you know? Um, this is a question I get asked quite a bit. Um, I don't, I do know that the compass dates back quite a while. It probably didn't look like what it looks like now but something similar, maybe with two sort of sides. Um, I actually had someone look it up for me, but I forgot when, how, back, how far back it dates to. Um, but other than just the, two, the tool of a compass, I'm sure they had many ways of creating circles. Because if you look back in history, if you look at architectural buildings of how beautifully proportionate they are and how symmetrical they are, um, I'm sure they had tools of measurement like this and tools for geometry. Thank you. And in terms of how these patterns were traditionally drawn, um, I think that's one of the, um, it's sort of like how back in those times you had guilds or of craftsmen where they would keep their secrets within their guilds and not really document it, or maybe they did document it or not really share it because those were their patterns and their sort of secrets and things that they have mastered. So that's one thing about geometric art is that it isn't um, really documented how these patterns have been drawn traditionally, but there are people um, who have in modern time uh, figured out how to draw it, like with the compass and a ruler. There is one historical document that is very famous. It's called the Topkapi Scroll, which is from the Topkapi Palace in Turkey, which has some documentation of how patterns were drawn. So 
At this point, we have our circle that's divided into eight equal parts. And next, we're going to draw our eight-pointed star. Now, if we look at the eight-pointed star that we are drawing, it is essentially two overlapping squares. So that's what we're drawing here. I'm going to take my pencil. Actually, I'm going to take a marker so that you can see it well. And I'm going to start off with these diagonal lines that we drew within the circle. I'm going to mark these four points here. And where those diagonal lines intersect the first circle that we drew, that's where these four points are. And I'm going to draw a square. Oh, I see. So this is what's known as a static square, what we normally think of when we think of a square. So I'm just connecting these four points that are within the circle. You want to take your time and be very precise. The more precise you are, the more proportional your pattern will be in the end. So we have a static square here. Next, we're going to draw another square that's going to be these four points. Again, it's where the lines intersect with the circle. So we have our horizontal line and our vertical line and where they intersect with the circle. And we're going to draw what's called a dynamic square. And a dynamic square is a square that's on a 90 degree angle. Okay. I'm feeling good about it this time. My lines are showing up or my, my dots are all, are all even. That's great. This is the real test. Once you draw your star, you'll know whether you've done it right. So it, it, we should have a competition amongst everybody. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and over here we have our eight-pointed star. And we ha also have the underlying geometric structure to draw our arabesque pattern. I'm just going to give everyone a minute. Kind of like in woodworking, you have to you have to leave enough room for your pencil to you know beside the ruler. Have you done woodworking before? Barely, but yes, yes. not not super de duper, just just kind of okay. But I've done a little bit of wood carving in university. Okay. All right. So we have our eight-pointed star. Next, we're just going to draw in a few more lines, which are going to be some structural lines for our arabesque pattern. So I'm going to take my ruler, and I'm going to take my pink marker, and I'm going to mark these points where the two squares overlap. So there's eight of these points. And I'm going to connect these eight points to the very center of the circle. And you'll notice when I connect it to the center of the circle, it's also connecting to another point. So you're actually only drawing four lines. like that. Now when I connect this one to the center, it's also connecting to this one. So you can draw that all together. Wow. And this one connects to this one. I find it really fascinating that all geometric patterns um, or Islamic geometric patterns start off with a circle 
a shape that has no sides or vertices. Hmm. And lastly, this one connects to this one here. And what we've done here is we were drawing in the lines of symmetry for our arabesque pattern. And arabesque is the more free flowy um, yes. organic pattern. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. I'm actually going to remove this. So, this pattern here is what we're drawing. Well, you can see the star underneath and line it. <laughs> and if you look at this pattern, let me take another ruler here. There, there's many lines of symmetry here, lots of lines of symmetry. And what we are doing is essentially we're drawing, we're going to be drawing one component, which is this, this one slice. This is one sixteenth of the pattern. And this is the pattern that is repeated all the way along. See, when you see this full pattern, you, you think, wow, that's so beautiful. That's so intricate. How am I going to draw this? And I'm, how am I going to make this so perfectly symmetrical? That's like impossible. But we're breaking it down into smaller, uh, smaller steps. So we're going to start with drawing 1 16th of the pattern. And that's all it really is. That's all we're drawing here. Okay, so Amina, I think there are still a few. There's this, April is saying she needs just a minute to kind of catch up. All right. She's working on her lines. Uh, April, if you'll let us know when you, when you get your, your, um, your little pie shapes all done, that'd be great. So this is one sixth of the pattern. And this pattern is when you fold it, it's reflected on this side. And then you could sort of reflect that whole pattern there. Mm. And then you have a quarter of the pattern. And then you could reflect that whole pattern and you have half. And then you just reflect that and then you have the full. Is, this where, the, is this where the parchment paper, paper comes in? Yes. I like to call this sort of like the snowflake method. It, has anyone made snowflakes in school where you fold up your piece of paper into eightfold or as many folds as you want? And you cut out your pattern, and when you open it, it's symmetrical all the way around. Mm. So that's what we're essentially doing. We're drawing one part, and then we're using the parchment paper to trace our pattern all the way around. Okay, and now, and now April, April says she's caught up, but she wants to make sure that she is caught up. So can she see your lines one more time? Yes, of course. And, I, and since I know April, I'll say, hey, April, that's five bucks. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so next step we can do is, we're, I'm just going over some of these lines with the marker to indicate where we're going to be drawing. Should we do that or are we? Are you yes, just that would be great. If you have a colored pencil or the pencil you are using or a pen, you could just indicate that this is the portion of the pie we're going to be working on. Okay. So I'm going to draw down here and down here. And once everyone's ready, we're going to get started on the arabesque portion. For the arabesque portion, I'm going to keep this right here so that we can refer to it. And let's see. That will work. Okay. 
So over here, we're working on this side of the pattern. So I'm gonna mark um, sort of like, so this is about one, th this line here, I'm gonna break it down into two thirds. So this is about one third, and then up to here is about one third, and that's another third. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. And over here, uh, I just want to remind everyone, what we're working on here is going to be our rough drawing. So if you make any mistakes, don't worry about it. Don't worry about erasing it or get too frustrated over it. Just draw over it. Um, this is going to be our rough drawing, which we're then going to trace and then transfer it to watercolor paper or any paper that you want to work with. Mm. So this point here, which is the center or one third, we're going to start by drawing a curved line like this that comes over here. Just like that. And then I'm going to draw another line, just like the same one. You want it to be about half a centimeter apart, like so. Next step is from the top of this line, we're going to draw sort of like a heart shape. And this heart shape is going to come up like this. And it's going to come down sort of like that. I'm just dotting it out before I draw it. You're going to leave a little bit of space there. Take your time. So if I break it down more, so the bottom of the heart shape is going to have a slight curve, mm. or so slight this way, and then it's going to curve the opposite way, like that. So it curves sort of this way, and then this way. Once we have this shape, we're going to do the same thing we did here. We're basically drawing double lines. So we're going to draw the outside line. And this line is going to touch this red line of symmetry here. I have a little fruit fly flying around on the screen. And it's going to come up. It's going to almost touch or touch the top. It's okay if it touches the top line here. If you want to leave a little bit of space, that's perfect too. Hmm. And this time, instead of following all the way down, it's going to curve upwards like this. So Amina, I have a I have a line that's sort of in, in between these. That's not going to hurt anything, is it? Because we're going to color it in eventually, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Any like you can even just color it in as you go. This is all rough. This is not going to affect your drawing because this is going to be colored in like this. You see how these lines are thick? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Okay.
Now, once we have these two lines down, we're gonna draw a few more curved lines. So one way to go about it is you can do this. This line, these lines can touch the center, the red line, kind of comes down like this. And then same thing here, this one kind of comes down like that, just touches the red line. You can take your time and go over it and fix up anything that you like. When I'm drawing, I like to do several strokes. Sometimes that helps. Some people like to draw in single strokes. We want it to be even thickness all the way around. Once we have that, we're going to draw a tapelic shape, if anyone remembers from the slideshow earlier. This tapelic shape is, starts off with sort of pointed dome at the top, like this. And it comes out like that. And then joins back in the center. So you could do it, um, you could do a little line of symmetry, a little dotted line. Mm. The top part is like that. I like to sort of think of it as two types of curves. You have like an S curve, which has two curves that are going in opposite directions. And then there's a C curve, which is just one curve. So over here we have two curves, one that's this way and one that's that way. And then for this part, you just have a single curve and here as well, an ever so slight curve. So the pointed dome at the top it has a, it's like a backwards S, like if I were to complete it like that, like that, except it's very slight, like. And then for the bottom part, you can think of it as a sort of circle, like this, but you're only gonna come down about a quarter of the way. And then you're going to join back in the center where the dotted line is with the C curve, which is just a single curve. And then you can draw the mirror image. So you can draw the circle on this side to help out. These circles just help you proportion it. It's always harder drawing the other half. <laughs> Come out about a quarter of the way and then you join it in the center. Okay, so the very top has kind of a, an inward curve. And then as you get about two thirds of the way down that, that top piece, it starts to have a uh, an outward curve. Is that right? Are you talking about? So you have a curve, inner curve, yeah. and then it comes out, and then you can draw a circle here. And about three, a quarter of the circle. Mm -hmm. We're just, we can do one more. An another way is to draw three full circles. So if this is my line symmetry, you have a circle here. When, when you're drawing circles and when you're drawing curved lines, um, one little technique is to think of this part of your hand as your compass. This is your pivotal point. This is where it's most comfortable to draw these curved lines. You don't want to be drawing in an awkward position because that will show in your lines. You want your movements to be fluid and you want to have space around you. You don't want to be in a small space and feel constricted when drawing. You want to feel um, like you can move your hands. So you have that circle here. And then when drawing your circle, um, it works best to not draw like this where you're moving your wrist or rather move your whole arm. So here I'm moving my whole arm to draw this third circle. The three circles really helped. Mm -hmm. 
So they're about the same size, the three circles, like this. And then the pointed dome shape comes out like this from the circle. And then comes down quarter of the way and joins in the middle. And the more you draw it, the better you get at it. I feel like um, it's kind of unreasonable to think that you'll get it perfect in the first try. A lot of this is um, trial and error and practicing. A lot of it is um, from many artists, especially pattern making because it's repetition. A lot of it becomes sort of like motor memory. So this little motif here, which is the Tapelic motif, Tapelic. We're going to draw that here. Um, and that's going to be sort of inside this heart shape. And it's going to be upside down. Now, you can go ahead and turn your paper around to draw it right side up. Or you can go ahead and draw it upside down as well. Oh. <laughs> Everything all right? I did it right side up. Oh, you already drew it in? I see. Yeah. So we're drawing it upside down, if you see there. Okay, I can do it. I, I can see that now. All right. Well, you, you've already had some practice drawing it, so. Yeah. You can do it again. Um, so for, we're drawing this over here. So let's map this out. So we're going to draw our three circles. The first one comes over here. Second one is this way. You don't have to draw the full pattern. You can draw the full um, leaf if you like, but you can just draw half of it because we're going to draw the other half. But sometimes it helps you to visualize um, the proportions better if you draw the full motif. Yeah. So we have our three circles. It's like a bunch of grapes. And I'm going to draw my upside down pointed dome shape here. It goes like that. And I'm going to draw my quarter of a circle. And then I'm gonna, when I draw this part, I'm actually just going to sort of connect it here to this edge. If that doesn't really work out in your drawing, that's no problem. You can just connect it however it fits. And you have half of it. You can draw the other half. If not, you can just leave it as is. So it would look something like that. Now, that's kind of about it. We've drawn our arabesque pattern. So one thing I would recommend at this point is you want to go in and sort of color it in. This is optional. So that you can go in and color it. Let's see if I have a color pencil. I'll use a marker. Actually, I'm just going to use pencil for now. I'm going to use the marker to outline it. So I'm just going to go and color it in. Make sure my lines are evenly um, have even thickness all the way around. Coloring it in will just help you visualize it better. And you can make little adjustments wherever you feel like you need to make any adjustments. I want to leave a bit more space over here, so I'm going to make a little adjustment. I, I don't want it to touch the outside star. Just leaving like a millimeter there. Uh. Any questions at this point? 
I think mine looks like an amoeba. Well, you know, the beauty of the snowflake method is no matter what your drawing is, it will be perfectly symmetrical in the end. <laughs> You know, it doesn't really look like much at this point. Um, it's not until you start to repeat it all the way around. And then I'll show you a little trick when we do the first repetition that really adds a nice touch to it. So once we have it colored in, I'm gonna take a colored marker. This step is optional, but it'll help you visualize it. So if you have a colored marker or a pen, or even just with your pencil, if you wanna go over it a bit more dark, Please, you can do that. I'm just going to outline the shape and just the shape here. So I'm going to outline like this. And I'm going to go all the way like that for this part. And when I draw this line, I'm also going to go, I'm going to do little, I'm going to start here when outlining. Sort of like how if these two lines overlapped. So I've outlined my pattern. I'm just doing this one slice. This is 1 16th of our pie. And in the meantime, I'm gonna get my tracing paper ready. So you can go ahead, do whatever finishing touches. If you're ready, you can take a piece of tracing paper and tape it on top so that it covers the entire star. If your tracing paper does not cover the entire star, you can always just, you can take um, two sheets of tracing paper like this. You can take two sheets of tracing paper and tape it together like that. You could just put a piece of tape here and a piece of tape there and that would work great too. Now, My, should we tape this down? Yes. Yeah. So I'm taking my tracing paper. I make sure, I'm making sure it covers the entire thing. And I'm going to tape it down. I have painter's tape. Any tape should work fine. Painter's tape is just um, not as sticky, so it won't rip your paper when removing it. You want to try to center your tracing paper as much as possible. Now, I traced it here because I don't want to cover any part of the star. So I taped it here and here. Yeah. And once you have that done, what we're going to do is we're going to take a pencil. And it's really important for this step that you use a pencil. If you have a soft pencil, like a 2B, a 3B, a 4B, that's even better. But any regular pencil should work. If you're using a harder pencil, like a uh, like a two age that might not work so well. Uh, the reason we're using a soft pencil is a softer pencil will give you a darker line. And that will be key in transferring this. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to trace the eight pointed star, but I'm not going to trace the overlap. I'm just going to trace the outside of the eight pointed star. So when I trace it, I'm stopping here. I'm continuing like that.
one way to make sure that you have everything that you need is you can just remove one tape and see if you have everything like that. So I have my eight pointed star and then just put it back down, make sure everything's lined up. Next, I am going to trace the red lines that I drew, the lines of symmetry, this one and this one. And it's gonna look like this. I'll just give everyone a moment to catch up. So I, I think I drew too much of the lines. But the parchment paper is pretty, pretty forgiving. It, it erases pretty good, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Even if you drew too much, that's fine. Um, you can erase it. I kind of did the two squares, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's easier. It's easy to just forget where to stop. Okay, I'm good. So once we have this, we're going to trace our pattern and we're going to trace just the outline. And this time, unlike when we were doing the rough sketch where if we were doing multiple strokes, we don't want to do that. We want to have really clean lines and um, try to do it in a single stroke. And this part you want to draw, um, you want to push down a little bit hard, not too hard that you're ripping the paper or causing an indent, but you want to get a nice dark line. should look like this. And once you have all these lines, you can actually remove it. I'm going to remove my piece of tape as well. I'm going to save that tape for later. I'm just going to flip to a blank side of the paper so that you can see what's on the tracing paper better. So this is my tracing paper. This is what I have. So you want nice clean lines. Remember to do this little overlap over here. And you want to make sure you have these uh, lines of symmetry as well. Now this is the fun part. This is where we start folding our parchment paper like a snowflake. So this is the side that I've drawn on. This is the side where the lead is. So I want to make sure that I am folding so that the lead side is on the outside of the parchment paper. And when I fold it, I want to match up the corners of the star. So the corners of the star, not the corners of the paper. Yes. And actually, I'm going to just because um, some of our stars might be just a little bit wonky, I'm actually going to go back and add one little step. I'm going to add one little step here. So I'm going to go back, put my tracing paper back, and tape it. This is just going to save us a bit, bit of trouble while we're folding. So I'm going to tape it back, and I'm going to add a few lines. So. I'm going to add, I'm going to draw in these lines here. Oh. Just so when we fold it, we have a line that we can fold on. 
So I'm gonna draw one, two, three, and four lines like this. The lines that we're drawing in are sort of where the points where the squares overlap. We're just gonna draw in these lines on our parchment paper. I'll give everyone a moment. I'm gonna remove my paper so you can see which lines I've drawn. That's what our tracing paper should look like. We have our star and the star is divided into eight. And then this one shape is divided further into two. Yeah, I'm still back at trying to retrace those lines again because I, I took my my thing all the way, my paper all the way off. Yeah, just take your time matching it back. Like so. And these are the lines that you want. Where where there's a corner between the two boxes. Yes. I usually don't draw in these lines, but I figured it would make it a little bit easier if we draw in these lines. Because even um, sometimes our, um, our points are just like a millimeter off. Yeah. And then that can make it a little bit difficult in the folding process. Yeah. Well, mine are perfect, so they're. Wow. No, they're not. <laughs> well, I believed you. <laughs> okay. When I think back, I don't really remember using a compass in school. I remember I, I used to buy, I bought the geometry set for school where I had like a little compass and a ruler. Mm -hmm. I don't really recall using a compass in school. So sometimes like, you know, just getting used to the compass and using it can be a bit tricky. So we have all these lines and we can remove our tape. Now, this is the side that we drew on. So this is the side that we drew on. So I want to fold my paper, making sure that the side that we draw, drew on is on the outside. So that's really important. We drew on this side, so we want to fold it this way. And this time, instead of matching the corners, you can still match the corners. You can fold on the line. You're going to fold on the center line. Here, I'll show you in just a second. So it's going to look like this. So I'm not folding, the, matching the corners, and just folding on the line here. Okay. Now, once we have this folded, this is the side that I drew on. I'm going to turn it over. And I am going to trace this part over here. Just exactly how you see it. And 
nice dark lines. On the other side. Oh, yeah. I see. On, on the other side. On of the, the other part. side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. I can see why you wanted a nice dark line now. So once you have that traced, you open it up, you have, you can start to see patterns sort of coming together like this. The next part, we're gonna fold on this line here. And again, you're gonna fold so that the side that you drew on is on the outside. Oh my gosh. You see your um, tapelic motif coming together? Holy cow. Mm -hmm. You're going to turn it over. And this time you can trace both these sides together. I find you can kind of roll the parchment paper if it isn't quite lining up just right. Mm -hmm. And one little tip here, um, when you're drawing this part, you want to make this one smooth line. Over here and here. So when I'm drawing that, I'm going to go right down, make that one smooth line. Take your time with this. up, I have one quarter of the pattern. And then I can fold on the next line. Just always make sure that your drawing is on the outside. on that line, turn it over, and then you can draw this whole part together. So now we're drawing, now we're doing the, the, uh, the, the, I see. Yeah, 
So every fold, you can draw more of the pattern at, yeah. at a time. Yeah. I didn't draw my original lines dark enough. You can always go back and... I did, yeah, I did. And you'll notice that when you're drawing, it's transferring to the other side. And that's sort of how we are going to be transferring it to our final paper or canvas or whatever medium we're using. You can even do this on wood. I can really see how accuracy on the first in all the circles and squares and then is so important. Yes. Um, I liked when I'm drawing uh, a geometric pattern, especially when it's a more complex geometric pattern, I like to draw it twice because you can figure out all the little things mm -hmm. that you around or the little spots where you need to be a bit more precise. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting that overlap over here. And look at that, I have half my pattern complete. Hmm. Okay. I'm hold it. okay, I did I, I did it wrong. I, I, I folded the wrong one, I think. I think I folded it halfway across. Halfway across. Can I have a look at it? I don't know if you I don't know if the camera will pick it up. I think what happens is I, I folded it like halfway across the paper mm -hmm. instead of um so I, I have marking here and here instead of here and here. I see. Oh. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. I think I'll just, mm -hmm. I think I'm just going to have to fold one more time. Yeah, I think you'll be fine. So once you have popped the pattern, you have one more fold and then you turn it around and you can draw the rest of the pattern.
Oh my goodness. Is it working out for you? Well, I definitely made some more work for myself. <laughs> and I really wish my, my original lines had been a bit darker. I think we're going to have some, some morphing is going to be happening. All part of the process. Yeah. With Islamic art, I've really learned to love the process of creating art and appreciating it. I was always a very impatient. Um, I couldn't wait to get to the coloring or the painting part when it came to art. And I would finish half my drawing and I would just start painting because I couldn't wait. <laughs> but it's, um, Islamic art has really taught me to be patient and persistent and um, I'm taking my time. Well, you know, and, and Islam, Islam makes a big, you know, that's a big part of Islam is, uh, is patience in, 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 a ch in the challenges of life, right? Mm -hmm. Patience and perseverance. Okay. Wow. So Amina, did you say that one of the one of the uh, one of the art pieces that you showed us was a Moorish one? Yes. Um, I showed quite a few slides of Moorish art. Okay. Well my I have ancestors that were Moorish. That were Moors. Have you been to Spain? No. No, but my, my family name on my mother's side is Morash. Oh, wow. So it was Moors that were, that, that had to leave Spain for Southern Germany after Christopher Columbus and Isabel and Ferdinand mm -hmm. uh, kicked them out or, you know, made them refugees. It's so, um, it's so nice that you know about your family and ancestry. As far as I know, both my parents are from the same city in India. Is that right? Yeah. And by coincidence, it just happened that way. My husband is, and my husband's family is also from the same city. Oh, India. wow. But we didn't know each other before. Yeah. Okay, so what's the next step here, Amina? Well, I hope I think I missed a part. So you're just going to keep tracing until you finish all of it. Yeah. And I'll just have a little left and I will talk about the next step. So I have mine all traced out and we have our pattern here. Oh my. over my camera. Sorry about that. Got a little excited. <laughs> okay. So once we're finished, we're going to open up 
our tracing paper and we have our full pattern. We want to make sure we're working on the side that we drew on. If you forget which side that you drew on, if you sort of hold it up to the light, it has a bit of a shine to it, the lead. Yeah. The side that I drew on. And these little parts here that overlap, we're going to interlace them. We're going to weave them, basically. So starting at one point, I have this um, eraser here. Um, you could use any eraser at the back of your pencil. Starting at this part, I am going to erase one side like this so that this line is going under that line. Oh. And now the next one, so this line is going over. And when I bring it over here, I want it to go under. So I'm going to erase it this way. And then following the line again, it's going under. So over here, it's going over. Follow it here, and it's going under. So I'm gonna erase it this way. You can do that all the way around. See how that creates this interlacing effect. And when you come back, it should match. If you have two overs, then you need to go back and check where something went wrong. Over here it's over, under, over, and then under. And we are back to the start and goes under. So that's perfect. Once we do the interlacing, we're pretty much done. And I am going to grab a piece of watercolor paper because I like to work with watercolors. And to transfer it, I am going to have the lead side. This is the side that I drew on. I'm going to have the lead side against the paper like this. And I'm going to center it on my paper and tape it down nice and secure. Okay, so we're putting it down lead side, right? So this is the side that I drew on and it's against the paper. Okay. And I want to tape it nice and secure. You might want to add a few more pieces of tape. And over here we have a few different options um, of how we can transfer it. First one being the most simple method, which will give you nice clean lines. It's a bit of work, but I think it's worth it in the end, is you're just going to trace over everything one more time. I know it seems like a lot of work. Um, what happens is the pressure of tracing over one more time transfers the lead on the other side of the paper. And that's why you wanted to use a soft pencil and you wanted to use, um, get nice dark lines. Mm -hmm. And let me just show, I'm just gonna take off one corner and I'm gonna show you how that transfers over nicely. Another, Thing you could use if um, any of you have agate stones or any stones that have like a really smooth finish, you could use that um, to rub against the paper to transfer. I have this burnishing tool and it has an agate stone here at the end that's made into the shape. And I could use this by applying pressure and rubbing against the tracing paper to transfer the lead. I've also seen people use spoons, um, using the edge of your spoon to just rub on it like this and transfer it. If you don't have any of those, just tracing over it one more time will do the job perfectly. 
Um, I find that tracing over it is a really good method because it's very, it gives you nice clean lines. I see. So we want to remind everybody that um, you don't have, we're not encouraging you to finish this tonight, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just going to kind of show us what to do and then um, and then when you get your project done, you can uh, upload it to Instagram um, with the hashtag interfaith or Holden Interfaith uh, Week. Is it Holden Interfaith Week, Ian? You got to help me out here. I think it's Holden Interfaith. It's Holden Interfaith. It is Holden Interfaith. No week. Thank you. Sorry. I knew I'd mess that up. So Holden Interfaith on, on, on Instagram, and then we will see it. And you'll see that I have an excellent fourth grade car already uploaded to that. So if you see a, like a fourth grade car with flame with a flamethrower out the back, you're at the right spot. That was just our test. <laughs> so you see how it's transferring over. You don't want to transfer the um, lines of symmetry. You just want to transfer these lines. And you want to transfer the star. Now, if you have space on your tracing paper, you can um, do this one last step. Or if you don't have space on your tracing paper, you could do this after you've transferred your pattern. And that's adding a border to your star. So if you see here, the outer star has a border. And you can just do that with your ruler. You can measure out a distance and draw in that border. You can just eyeball it however you want to do that part. And just draw it in like that, about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half, however thick you want it. Just add a nice border at the end. I'm going to do that part after I finish tracing it or transferring it. The nice thing about this tracing paper is you can do multiple um, copies of this. Mm. So you can make two or three of these and use the tracing paper for it. from anyone? Anything you want me to go over? Any questions? And so at this point then, once we get it transferred, then mm -hmm. we can go ahead and pick some colors and, you know, make the border and mm -hmm. then, um, and then we can, we can do the coloring. Yeah. Um, I think at this point I'll share some images of just some inspiration for how you can go about coloring and choosing colors. Moment. So 
So over here, this is an example of geometric pattern. This is a more complex geometric pattern. You can see all the different lines. And from here, you get the shapes, the different shapes you have, an eight-pointed star in the center, and you have a few stars on the outside. You have different shapes. And then from there, there's the uh, transferring process and the painting process. So there's a few different techniques I like to use when painting. So I like to, in a lot of my paintings for geometric patterns, I like to use sort of a lot of negative space. So I'm not painting in every single shape, I'm painting in every other shape. And that creates a really nice effect because um, not only is it easier because you're only painting half of it, it creates a nice sort of balance where you're seeing the white of the paper and also the different colors. So you can see how that looks where I've painted every other shape here. Um, so you have the white of the paper showing through, but you also have all these different colors. Here's another example of negative space, how that can really make the pattern stand out. So you have the black of the paper showing through and I painted in every other shape. Here is an arabesque pattern. Um, when choosing colors, I like to limit my color, color palette to about three colors. A lot of times I like to use light colors, like over here I have the turquoise and the darker blue, which are similar colors. And then adding maybe a hint of um, warm colors. So I have the two cool colors, the blues, and then a hint of warm with the brown and the tan colors. And over here, um, in some parts you can see the gold. I like to use gold as an accent color to bring parts of the painting um, to add a little accent, some brightness, some sparkle. Over here with geometric patterns, um, instead of, over here instead of painting in the shapes, uh, like we did here with the inside of the pattern where I interlaced the lines, I wove the lines, I did something similar with the geometric pattern where I've woven the lines it creates um, this beautiful basket interwoven look. Uh, let's have a look. Here is another arabesque pattern, which is similar to what we've done today. And over here, I've essentially only used in one color. I've used in gold, and the background is the background of the paper. So you don't really need to have spend a lot of time in color choice. Sometimes just if you're if you don't really know what to do, you can choose one color and just that one color can really bring it out. Over here it's very subtle. I've used two different golds. One is a slightly yellower gold and one is a bit more bronze. Mm -hmm. And just that, you know, playing around with that sort of monochromatic theme where you have different shades of the same color. And well, then it looks just like it's floating on the paper. Right. <laughs> And just adding a nice uh, outline with a fine liner pen really brings it together. So I think really simplicity is key. Uh, choosing maximum three colors. I would recommend two colors. Uh, maybe the third color just being a little bit of an accent here and there. And using your paper, the color of your paper to your advantage, using that as a background. Um, really helps, especially with really intricate patterns, because sometimes adding a background color, you're trying to color in all these spaces and it can get a bit messy and the pattern doesn't really shine through. So yeah, these are just some ideas I wanted to share with you on different ways you can paint your pattern. I really hope you enjoyed it and I would, I'm would i really excited to see how your patterns will turn out. Before I go, I just wanted to share what it would look like with the border when it's traced. Quick share.
don't know if, is it frozen? Uh, it's there. It's just partly. Uh, I think it's frozen. It might take a while. Yeah, there's a lot of data going there. <laughs> yeah, so this is what it'll look like with the border. So I just wanted to share that final image with you. Thank you everyone for joining me. I hope you really enjoyed this. And I, I'd love to see what your final um, products look like. Remember the hashtag Holden. Holden Interfaith. Holden and then or you, or you can send it to Ian at paths to understanding.org and you might want to write that down. So it's Ian at paths, like multiple roads, paths to understanding.org. And then um, we'll, we'll be able to get those to Amina. And then we might make a little, you know, a little uh, uh, video with some of the artwork in it uh, between this and, and, and what's happening on Tuesday night. And then on Thursday night, Amina and Reiner Waldman Atkins will be, will be on webinar um, to give you any feedback about your art so, um, and if you have any questions at that point, so we'd love to see you that night. But uh, thank to, thanks to everybody for, for being here. Uh, April and Gail and Kim and Margie, Rita, Sharon and Suzanne, we're just very happy to have you all here. And Amina, thank you so much for this. I, I came in kind of a little bit uh, foggy headed, but being able to focus on this makes me feel better. So thank you very much. And, and also Cindy's been watching on, on Facebook, so. Amina, thank you very much. And if, if we were all together, we'd give you a, a clap, a round of applause. But right now, we'll just send our appreciation to you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a great night and, and keep working on that art. <laughs>